When you think of a corporate vice president or executive leader, what's the image that first pops in your head? Is it a bunch of men in power suits gathered around a conference table? Is it super serious people toiling over boring budget statements and strategies and their golf game? Our guest expert today, Kirk Roy, is a vice president, but he broke the mold of the traditional stigma of leadership. He paved his own way with integrity, authenticity, relatability, and a great dose of humor. How did he do it? By answering just one question. And you're going to want to know exactly what that was. And if you're a numbers or a technical person and you're not sure how you can be a successful leader and climb that leadership ladder, well, Kirk's advice will be gold for you. You're going to learn how to climb that leadership ladder, still be yourself, and build a strong team while you're doing it. And stay tuned to the very end where Kirk shares his biggest success secret when it comes to finding life balance at that executive level. Before we get started, if you're excited to learn strategies to help you become the authentic leader you're meant to be, hit the subscribe button and bell icon now so you'll be the first to know when a new adventure is posted every week. Welcome to Adventures in Leadership on Christy TV. This is where high achievers go for the tools, confidence, and motivation to become a successful leader. Let's do this. I'm very excited to introduce you to Kirk Roy. He is the vice president of underwriting and actuarial trend for a major nonprofit health insurance company. And that means he helps manage risk with strategic consultation, focusing on the evolution of their people, processes, and systems to make the best decisions to move the business forward for the customer. Now, Kirk's done it all. He's been responsible for underwriting for major group and individual customers, plus actuarial trend initiatives for the entire enterprise. And he served in leadership positions with individual business, Medicare, corporate financial planning, and led reorganization through the regulatory change resulting from the Affordable Care Act. Kirk's jam is mathematics and statistics, and he's a trained actuary, but don't let his super smart technical brain fool you. He's also full of energy, fun, and an all around personable leader that's doing great things. Thanks for tuning into Christy TV. And we have an exciting guest speaker for you today. His name is Kirk Roy. He is an awesome leader. I've gotten to know him very well over the years. So I'm really excited that he's joining us here today. Kirk, how are you doing? I am doing great. I'm excited to be here. I uh, appreciate the invitation and I'm looking forward to a wild roller coaster ride of a discussion. <laughs> I, I expect nothing less from you. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And if you heard his background, you heard a little bit of his professional background just a second ago. But, you know, Kirk, tell some of these people who are meeting you for the first time, just tell a couple little things about you. It could be a little professional, but how about some personal stuff? Let's get to know you. Uh, sure. Thank you. The um, So what's my self-concept? I think myself uh, first as a uh, a father and a husband. I, I've got two great kids, uh, a wonderful wife. And so they're the top of my pyramid, if you will. Yeah. Um, and then personally, uh, I'm not that interesting, but I have a sort of a, a mindset of I love, I'm excited about growth. Oh, and yes. growth has lots of different dimensions and seeing how I can build new knowledge, grow. Uh, I try to be active. You know, what can I do new and different there? creatively, yeah. I guess is the word. Yeah. The, um, you know, I, I, I try to learn new types of music. I, I, I play some music and just exploring new for, with the idea of growing and my own potential is something that really drives me. So that's the only interesting thing about me, but it expresses itself a lot of different ways. And then, you know, you've already uh, expressed uh, professionally, I uh, lead primarily people who would construe themselves as numbers people. Okay. Um, and so really thinking about uh, a technical person um, trying to pretend to be a leader or learn how to be a leader as well, it has been a lot of what I spent my professional career on and trying to, so oh, that's wow. me. 
Well, that's good. Well, well, two things. I know there's a lot of interesting stuff about you. So that's why I invited you here. So I'm excited for you to talk a little bit more about that. And the other thing, I'm really glad that you brought up that you're a technical person. You're a numbers person, right? And you lead a lot of numbers people. But just because you're technical doesn't mean you can't be an awesome leader such as yourself. And it's kind of funny because a lot of the people that I talk to in my coaching programs and in uh, when I go and speak they are a lot of technical people that's who I specialize in actually uh, accountants and technical folk IT things like that so I'm really excited to hear what you have to say and for all those people out there that are technical and not sure if they want to make the jump to leadership this episode's for you. I'm sure that you didn't just come out of college and become a vice president. So kind of walk me through a little bit of your journey. How did you become a vice president of such a, a big company? I always tell, you know, people use ask me, what was your plan to get where you are? And I was like, well, that presumes that I had a plan and that I thought this is where I would end up. And of course, none of that is true. I feel like my journey was a series of sometimes lucky, sometimes opportunistic stumbles into a bunch of different experiences that led me here. So I want to tell you a little bit of that story because yeah. it's only that looking backwards that I can understand how I got here because there's no way I planned it. You know, it just it, it came to be. So, you know, I'm a numbers person. Uh, I got a job in consulting. And um, I thought this was very prestigious, right? You got this high powered consulting job. Wow, that's great. And then you learned the numbers don't mean anything if the client who's paying you doesn't understand what you're talking about. So that was a big sort of learning thing like, oh yeah, it's more than getting the right answer. It's sharing that answer in a compelling way. So that was something I developed there. Um, but then I told you I'm a family man first, if you will. And uh, the consulting life wasn't conducive to what, everything I wanted to, to be here at home. So uh, when I moved back to, to industry, you know, I, I was working and then my boss got promoted and he said, you should take this manager job. And I'm like, wow, that's, thank you for the compliment. As opposed to you're a technical person who's thinking about making the jump, the jump happened to me. Mm. And the big insight for me was, I didn't even really realize that leadership was a different part of the job. I was like, I know the numbers. Now I've learned how to communicate them well. I'm, I, I'm applying those numbers to some business problems. And then, oh, so now I'm leading a team manager, right? I'm managing a team. What does that have to do with leadership? That just means I got more numbers to do and other people to run the numbers. Right. And like, I was probably such a terrible <laughs> leader because I was focused on the work. Yeah. And I didn't conceptualize in my own mind that the leadership role was a distinct part of my job that needed distinct attention, distinct skills. Yeah. But when I finally woke up and realized, oh, I'm not just responsible to Tumblr, and if I can steal a Simon Sinek quote, I'm not responsible for the results, I'm responsible for the people who are responsible for the results. There and like that mindset shift was huge for me. And maybe, maybe that's common to numbery technical people that you think it's about the work, that's what's important. Um, so that was like a big insight. So I sort of went on that journey of starting to figure that out, continue to read everything I can. And then, so I'm stumbling along and um, this huge project comes up at the organization that I get tapped for. You know, we start working on this and realize it's much bigger than we even thought it was. And ultimately, I presented to our board of directors. And afterwards, my boss came to me and said, our CEO wants to elevate this role and position to an executive position. And you uh, will take that job. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> and my eyes were this big. Again, I had no initial like, celebratory feeling. It was all fear. And the fear came from oh, well, I've been doing these things, I've been leading teams, that sort of thing. But if you're an executive, that's something different. And like the mental concept I had of, as, of an executive was, you know, an old white dude who made his employees miserable, <laughs> never went home, worked too hard, yeah. probably was estranged from his family. Like I had all those mental yeah. concepts yeah. in there. And, you know, 
that probably comes from the movie, probably comes from some people I know. But when I sort of express like, oh, I'm not sure if that's what I want. I don't know if that's right for me. And my boss said the most liberating thing that probably any leader has said to me. In addition to saying like, you're going to do the work anyway, so you might as well take the role. It's a good gig. That was like the practical part. But the most important thing she said was, it's not whether or not you want to be a vice president. It's what kind of vice president do you want to be? And that was like a big, um, I tell that story often because it was such a pivotal moment. Again, mindset, Uh, the conceptual mindset of my job as the manager is to do good work to my job as the leader is to take care of the people so they can do good work. Mm -hmm. Same thing here. What's an executive, a box that you put in that can only behave one way that I didn't think would be conducive. And then, so that gave me, she gave me permission to be myself and do things the way I thought were important or emphasize the things in a way that spoke to my strengths and all those sorts of things. Now, having said that, it still took me a while to even give myself permission to do that, but I've been developing that permission to be authentic or quirky or unique in a way, not just for quirkiness sake, but in a way that's helpful and helpful in a unique way that's that's useful. And so uh, some people might say, I say dude too much in meetings. (laughs) Um, I I, uh, famously have brought some musical instruments in for presentations, not just for entertainments, but for purposeful, but it made it fun. You know, because you always hate the boring presentation. People always comment like, yeah, you did it. You gave that great talk. And I'm not sure what you said, but I remember you told a story about uh, Marvel superheroes. And like, but I did that because those stories resonated with the topic that was at hand, or I, that I felt like they would. So I get good feedback on that. But I wouldn't have had permission to do that without that empowerment for my leader and the self-concept of the thing you're supposed to, you're doing is not the thing that you're supposed to be you got to be the thing that you are. And like, that was such a chance. So my journey there is essentially, I stumbled into realizing that leadership was a thing and that authentic and servant leadership was a thing. And that's how I think I've blossomed as a leader. So that's one half of the story. Does that all make sense? Yeah, no, that, 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 that makes a lot of sense because unfortunately, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that right now that are learning about leadership that have that same vision of, well, you, you once you become a leader, you, you know, you never see your kids, you never see your spouse and you know, it's only people with suits and you got to be very serious and all that kind of stuff. And you know, what you just said, you, you basically just broke the mold and said, and, and you had, and the big thing was your leader, she gave you permission and empowered you to say, no, Kirk, that is not how you need to be. We need you to be you because yes. you're awesome as you. We hired you. We don't want you to change you. So I'm glad that you yeah. brought that point up. So yeah, keep going. This is great. Yeah, that was super important. Oh, that, that would be, that's a great set of insights that I can apply if you get those opportunities. Again, I feel like I've, uh, I've, I've fallen into these opportunities. This was handed to me. My boss said, we we're going to elevate you. Like I didn't have to fight for them. So how did those happen? Yeah. So the story I tell myself um, about, well, how did I even get the opportunities is a two-part play. First part was, you know, they used to have the just say no campaign, right, for, for uh, drugs. Okay. Um, I had just, I think in retrospect, it wasn't like part of my Machiavellian plan. I had the just say yes strategy. Someone would come by and they're like, hey, this thing's going on. Will you help us out with that? Yeah. Hey, you know, we got something. We need a volunteer to go do this. Will you do that? Yeah. And I, was, I mostly did that because they were interesting. I get bored easily, you know? And so it's like, oh, can I take a hiatus from my regular job to do this other thing? Sure. Um, but what that did for me is I had to learn a lot of new stuff. I got exposed to a lot of new people, but I wasn't like managing my brand with exposure. I was just like, yeah, yeah I want to do something meaningful and be helpful doing it. Mm-hmm. And that's maybe the other half of uh, the story is, so when I said yes to a lot of things, I got... Um, a lot of opportunity to be really useful. And so I'd go to these meetings and I'm like, I'm this junior person. And like some of the C-suite people are like debating about stuff. What am I even doing at this meeting? How can I be helpful? So like the next meeting I came in, I said, I heard you all say this and you were debating about this. 
is this a piece of paper that would help like us connect this issue and this issue? And they were like, yeah, bring that every meeting. That's what we're gonna talk about as the basis thing. And I didn't know if that was the right thing to do, but it's what I thought was, would be useful. So I just, I said yes. So I got a lot of opportunities to be in spots. And then I took those spots and said, what unique contribution can I make? And how can I be helpful and useful? And I just kept doing that. And I kept getting invited to other tables. And then the, the person uh, I was talking about, the reason she even knew me because I was on this project with her, trying to translate between her and the CFO, what their objectives were, and they sort of speak a, <laughs> a different language. <Yeah. laughs> and she was the one who ultimately thought of me for the role for this special project that turned into a vice president. So I think wow. it's two parts. One is my journey to leadership comes from taking the opportunities, saying yes all the time, and then just be useful. Be helpful, that, have that be your intent, and just show up with stuff. No one asked me to put that thing together that everybody ended up using. Um, just try to be as useful as possible. And then as you go on that journey, you got to remember or learn that leadership is a different part of the job. You know, you got to have the, whatever the content is your job, and then there's the leadership part of your job. And that other thing, that's a lifetime career of figuring that out, right? Situational, all that stuff. So that's kind of how I describe well, how did I get the opportunities? And then what did I do with the opportunities was this insight around what leadership means and what authentic leadership means um, that I'm still trying to figure out today. <laughs> well, I think you're doing a pretty good job, you know, if you've gotten right. all that all that fun feedback and everything. And, you know, I've always known you as a, a casual kind of guy, right? And everybody, I think it's really important that you touched on that everybody has their own style. And I don't mean style of leadership, like authoritarian, you know, you know, all yeah, that kind yeah, of yeah. dictatorship and that kind of thing, all those science names, you chose your own style. So you were empowered by your leader to say, Hey, you know, go ahead and just do what you do. And you just said, okay, well, I'll just kind of figure it out. And you made yourself useful, you made yourself valuable, and it was just authentically you. So I would love to dive in just a little bitty bit more on that of once you are kind of going up the, the leadership ladder, right? There are so many people out there that are afraid to speak up or to do something out of turn, right? Because a lot of them, like you said, have this view of when you're around C-suite or leadership, you've got to act this way. And, you know, here you are and saying, you know, what's up, dude, you know, in your meeting, <laughs> stuff like that. I'm talking about Marvel comics, but again, like you do it with purpose, right? You obviously do it with respect and everything like that. Can you share like a little bit of insight of how to, to be confident in doing that? Because it's not like you got promoted to VP and you're like, hey, you know, and let's just do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably had to kind of figure it out. So can you take us down that mindset journey of, you know, building your confidence to get to the point where you can just be Kirk Roy? So when Kirk Roy shows up to a meeting, they know everything you see is what you get. So how did you build that confidence? How did you get there? Yeah, um, so let yeah. me think about that question because it, it definitely, like you said, it didn't happen overnight. It was a process. And it comes yeah. from a, a couple of pieces of insight. And then a couple of willingness to experiment are, are the two things. And so the first insight I had, like, you know, you go into the uh, our version of the C-suite meeting. And I was on this big project. And so I was in there all the time. And a couple of things I noticed, right? I'm all, I was, I'm in, I am still in awe, but I was really in awe of these people. They are so smart. And, you know, the worst thing you want to have happen is you go in there and you're supposed to be on point and accountable for something and then start talking and they ask you a question you don't know the answer. Yeah. Right? So, and I would, I would sort of like kick myself around like, oh, I can't believe I got a gotcha. I planned, you know, I should be on top of my game. And then I realized, you know what? They just spent four hours talking about a whole bunch of issues that I didn't have line of sight to. So, of course, they're going to have perspective. The story, again, a story I told myself was, and that's their role. It's not my role to know all of the questions that are on the CEO's mind. My role is to bring my stuff. And if I didn't anticipate their question, it's because they have a different perspective because they have a different role. So that was like one thing that was, that was a little bit liberating. And the other thing was, I also noticed like, because I came in so often, you know, it's always supposed to be like, do your five minutes, you know, what do you need from a make your case, you know, all that sort of thing. Yeah. And then I realized they forgot what we talked about last time. They got a lot of stuff on their mind. The other thing was I just used to go and say, I don't have to be 
the brash, you know, whatever. I'm going to own this and you're going to get my thing. Yeah, I didn't have to get the gloves on because my role was to bring what I thought the issues were, um, what I thought we should do, and their job was to help shape that and then help pick a direction. And it wasn't a failure if they didn't accept my proposal. That's not their job is to accept my proposal. It's not my job to make sure every proposal is set. I just had this thing around, I had to remind them what we were talking about and why I thought it was important because they got a million things on their mind. And then I would say, here's what I intend to talk about. And then I would ask, is that what you want to talk about? Because I'm not on my agenda. I'm on your agenda. Because the mindset was, I am here to help you solve this, these problems or to be of service to you, this C-suite. And if that's my role, and my role isn't to know and do everything, it was just, it was very liberating to just say, you know what? Here's what I'm going to plan to talk. Here's why I'm going to talk about it. If you don't want to talk about, if you've got other issues on your mind, because the worst thing is to make people sit through a 20 minutes of presentation when they're like, yeah, but you know what? What we really need. So I just did that at the beginning. And I said, yeah. I'm here to help what you all need to do. And when I started doing that, they said, well, what we really want to talk about is this. And I'm like, well, that is great. I thought about this this far or, or like, okay, I'm going to scrap the first half of my presentation, but that's in the second half. Let's just go right there. And that made them more real and human and approachable and all that sort of thing. That was the insight. And so what's the insight? From that? The insight is they don't know my stuff better than me, but they have a different role and perspective. And if I just say, I'm going to come in with my best and that's my role, then that's okay. And that's all I can do, right? If I don't have the answers, I also had a, a dear friend and colleague say uh, the most important phrases that you can master as a leader are, uh, I was wrong, I don't know, um, I changed my mind, and I made a mistake, Wow! right? And just when someone asks you a question, and you, uh, you know, it's the CEO says, well, what do you think about this? And if you say, I hadn't thought about that, um, that's an important perspective, I don't know, and I'll get back to you, like that, people think they don't have permission to do that. I started doing that, I started asking what they wanted to talk about, you know, so anyways, I just, I made, the conversations less about me and more about them. And that opened up the interaction differently. So that's kind of like one whole half of that. So that's one piece of it. Um, the second piece of sort of having that permission to be myself is I took measured steps towards trying stuff out. So I'll, and a couple examples are like, I was on this big project and I did an all employee update every once in a while. And it's normally like, there's a format, right? It's PowerPoint, there's bullets, uh, you have to fill it out. And so I said, well, I got a three slide thing. I'm gonna do it all in pictures like a TED talk because I thought that would be more interesting and more compelling because it was like the third time I'd been in front of this group. And so I just tried that. And then did it work, did it not work? And then similarly, I started using language, inserted, it's almost like, you know how reporters uh, in, in many cases, it used to be this, the reporter's never in the story, but there's a movement in a lot of like podcast journalism where the reporter is part of the story. I started putting more of myself into the discussion and I would okay. start using words like, I feel, or I'm afraid that, right? Hey, we're working on this problem. And what I'm afraid is it's going to have a negative effect on how the team feels, you know, or just like that. And so I put my actual emotions into it. And, um, and so I'd, I'd start doing presentations and I'd say, you know, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I'm feeling. I started saying things like, I told the story, oh, I can tell the story here too. Um, <laughs> I, started, I told the story about how in my, one of my old roles, I wasn't taking care of myself, I started getting panic attacks. As a leader, you stand up and you say, has anyone ever had a panic attack before? Let me tell you about my experience with that and then what worked and what we could do differently and recognize that things in life and things at work cause stress that can lead to that sort of thing. It was sort of like finding uh, areas to be vulnerable and mm -hmm. share either your feelings, your fears, your experiences. Mm -hmm. I just started doing that more and more. And like, uh, again, it wasn't Machiavellian, but the more I did it, the more people were like, I'm so glad you had that conversation wow. because me too. Wow. Um, and maybe the last part of that, that piece, and then I'll take a breath. A lot of people said to me, the more I did that, the, it goes back to the mold thing. 
oh, yeah. the executive or the leader, the CEO, they got this all figured out. And everything you do with them is a test. Do you have it figured out? Because I've got it figured out. And we're all trying to figure it out. And I think that there's this myth that all the leaders and executives know what they're doing, have to figure out, don't have any fouls, uh, uh, fallibilities. But there's a, a, a great quote from Amanda Palmer that, that was, amateurs pretend they're not winging it. Professionals know that they are, uh, right? And it's just like, that's the same thing. They didn't, they, if everything was figured out, they wouldn't need me. I'm trying to figure it out. And so revealing that, hey, I'm not sure how we're going to do this, but here's a problem I think we should go attack. What do you want to do about that? Like, that's another vulnerability of not having all the answers and not pretending that you need to have all the answers, mm -hmm. right? So, I don't know. That was a long ramble about uh, <laughs> thinking about that. How do you become yourself? But I think my summary is I made my interactions with everyone to realize everything's not a test, I guess, number one. Um, and that the people I'm working with, including the senior leadership, are people too. So I gave myself permission around that. And then the other piece is just, uh, I took the opportunity to try and share vulnerabilities or share thoughts um, and be a little bit more myself a little bit at a time. And the more positive feedback I got, the more I did it. And here I am. Same dude. Oh, yeah, yeah, same dude. Uh, yeah, just leading a bigger team, right? You know? I'm glad that you brought it up. So people, especially the numbers people and technical people out there, <laughs> that You're always want to be numbers people, but right, exactly <laughs> that always want to be right or or anything like that. What you just said, straight from the mouth of a numbers guy, said, "Look, I know that I didn't have all the answers, but you also knew that." All the other people didn't always have all the answers. Yes. That's a good point to know that you might not have it, but nobody else in there did either. And especially that's why they wanted you on that team because yeah, they wanted right. your talent. You're there for a reason. So that was a great and point. If you, to if, if, you, if you start with, I don't need all the answers and no one else has all the answers and the work is to try and create answers together, Yes. That, I think, uh, you hit the nail on the head there. That's, that's huge. That's absolutely huge. Um, I love that you talked about your confidence and how you kind of allowed yourself to just be Kirk Roy, which is great. And then you added a relatability factor, which I think is so important for leaders. If you're going to lead a team, they have to be able to at least relate to you to know you're a human being, you know, with emotions and things like that. You allowed yourself to be vulnerable. So I'd love to dive into just a little bit of, so you've got all this cool stuff that you've done. Is there something in particular that you're passionate about being the leader? Is there like a number one thing that you're known for that you love doing as a leader that just really lights you up? So I think there's a lot of things that I think I get good feedback on for me, but then I'll tell you, uh, I'll go into the thing that I'm most interested in and passionate, I guess would be. Yeah, do word. that. Yeah, um, for sure. One uh, first, I want to do that. The thing that I think is most important that that doesn't get a lot of playtime is nobody else but you, if you're the leader, is going to define for clarity what we're trying to accomplish and why and where we're going, like that vision piece. Mm -hmm. And some people, and then communicating that vision piece is super important. So I spend a lot of time on that. Okay. Because like, oh, you can get into the work, but if why are we doing this? What are we trying to accomplish? What does good look like? How will we know if it's done? Like all of those questions are important. So I spend time there and I get good feedback that the more time I spend on that and more time I spend communicating and reiterating it, that's very helpful. So that's okay. important. The biggest thing that sort of lights me up, if you will, these days, I told you in my little spiel about personal, like I'm into this, the whole concept of growth. What's the whole point of yeah. life? You just to yeah. figure out how to grow and choosing where you want to grow and, and what that means to you and all that sort of thing. So this whole idea of growth and helping people meet their, their fullest potential, right? We're all different. We're all different aptitudes. We all have different limitations. We're all different aspirations. I believe that everybody is capable of getting further towards their best self, whatever that definition of best self it is. Mm -hmm. And that is such a inspiring thing to see anybody make any progress on that like I just think that's amazing and fascinating yeah. and it has a lot of different dimensions in terms of people grow and adapt physically they grow and adapt intellectually they grow and adapt emotionally and it's such a complicated problem like if you were just going to do an academic paper on how does someone reach their potential 
Well, there's personal things, like I said, you know, your physical health and your mental health and your energy and your inspiration and creativity, those are all connected, oh, right? Yeah. So I do focus on like, what are the things that enable me to be my best self? And so like, I try and get better sleep now. I have, uh, I'm not a very organized person, but I try to have actual morning routines. And I do focus on physical exercise because that works for me and that feels important. You know, so it's like the whole personal piece. Then there's the second piece around team. What is it about the interpersonal environment that allows or doesn't allow someone to be, right? Is there tension? Do we feel like we're on the same page? Do we feel like we got ourselves back, right? Those are things that can promote and it's all situational, right? And then there's sort of like the institutional level, right? What does the culture feel like? What's taboo? What's okay? Um, is there equity? Um, like a whole bunch of those things are really important. Even talk about our broader institutions in the culture, right? What of those help or hinder? There are some communities that are more impacted by institutional biases and that sort of thing. And what the biggest travesty about all of those is they limit any of the people in those communities to fulfill their potential, right? And so that feels like the biggest loss for me. Yeah. Um, so that's what I think about a lot. And so when I spend, I, I guess I have two things. Like if that's the highest goal or the, the greatest good in your book is for someone to reach their fullest potential, then again, if you define your role as a leader to help people meet their greatest potential, then you've got to connect with them, get to know with them, know what their strengths and superpowers are, what their aspirations are. Then you start asking questions, not like, well, what is this person, you know, this is person have the skills to deliver the work. You start asking like all the ways down Maslow's hierarchy. Does this person feel safe here? <laughs> you know, yeah. does this person feel heard? Mm -hmm. um, and then you start getting into a whole bunch of things that are fundamentally human needs. And then, you know, there's a famously in uh, servant leadership circles, they would say uh, instantiation of that is your job as a leader is to identify and meet the legitimate needs of the people that you have the privilege to serve yeah. uh, or to lead. Well, what's a legitimate need? And it goes down to them as a human being. I have a need to feel like I belong. That's the number three on Maslow's hierarchy. I have a feel to need hurt. I need there to be, this to be a just environment. And you start thinking differently about what you need to do as a leader. It's not just playing the work and the clarity and like famously, there's a story in our department, we, we sit on two floors of, a, of an office building uh -huh. and the people, there was this real and perception that the people on this, the top floor were better than the people on top and they got better treatment and more status and they were more valued. And oh. it's, a, it's a long story, but, and yeah. then when I came uh, to lead this particular team that, that I'm with right now, I heard most often when I you know, went and talked to people was, uh, yeah, the people on the top floor, they've got coffee and creamer up there in the break room. And on the, on the other floor, they got coffee, but you got to pay five cents for the creamer. And it sounds like such a silly story. And there was that real sense of inequality. But like, you start thinking about those things and people are like, I never taught you that at business school. I never went to business school, but so I never would have been taught that anyway. So you start looking for those things. And so I'm really passionate about being those potential. And I think there's a lot of things that get in the way. And there's a lot of things we can use to amplify people's aspirations and potential, but you got to start thinking of them as human beings. And what are those fundamental human beings? What gets in the way? How do you understand, not the way I think about it, but the way you think about it? And how do we leverage that um, in accomplishing whatever we're trying to do, that greater good that the organization is trying to do? So that's a long ramble, but see, I'm getting all sweaty. It's Because uh, it, uh, it is exciting. Because if you, when you see it happen, or someone says, you know, that one, it, like my boss, that one thing she said to me led to a 10 plus year journey that went in a different direction because of one sentence. And if I feel like if I can do that to one person a year for the rest of my career, full success. Huge. But then you've got to really focus on that question and, and start asking different questions about the people that you work at, with and have the, uh, the privilege to serve. Kirk, tell me, what do you believe are the top two to three traits that a brand new leader needs to learn quickly? Because a lot of these people that are listening right now and watching, they're aspiring leaders, they're brand new leaders, 
or, you know, maybe they've been leaders for a while. They kind of want to learn some new tricks. Um, but what would you say if I was a new leader and I was just having a team, what are the top two to three traits that they need to learn quickly? So traits, so a couple of things I, I, I've already mentioned is the first thing you have to do, especially as a new leader, is don't do what I did uh, <laughs> uh, and pretend that leadership is not a distinct part of your job you need to focus on. So that's what I would say is you got to start with that my role as a leader needs to be defined and needs to have dedicated time, skills, and sessions. So, and then within that bucket, I feel like there's three things that people need to be able to do to identify the most critical factors for their success of their function. So that's kind of like knowing your business well enough to understand where the future needs to be. Because then the second trait is the ability to clarify and communicate what your group is trying to accomplish and why and okay. what success looks like, because that goes to roles and goals and provides clarity. That's how, how your team will get there. And then maybe the last piece I would say is the ability to help assess your team. And that has like three dimensions to it, right? You just have to really be honest about the talent, where to plug, like what talent do you have? Um, how do you best leverage and organize that talent? Um, both, you know, team structure and organizationally, all those sorts of things. Um, every role I've been, I, I think I, I feel like I've importantly had, had to ask the question is, is this the best way for these people to be successful as individuals and as a team? And usually the answer is there's always opportunity there. Sure. So that's why I would say leadership is part of the job. Know what good looks like. Make sure you have clarity and then make sure that your team is structured so that they can be most successful, personal, team-based or uh, organization. Yeah. Wow. No, that's, that's perfect. And it, 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 I just love the fact that, you know, obviously you're breaking the mold as the traditional vice president that everybody thinks, <laughs> you know, or whatever it is, you know, whatever that, that vision is. But I love the other thing is that you're very team-based, you know, you, you want to know what are everybody's strengths, what can we do to the advantage and not just for the advantage of the company that you work for, but for themselves. So the more that they grow themselves, obviously the happier and the better they're going to be. And that really comes, like you said, from that authenticity and breaking the mold and say, look, I'm a dude, you know, and this is what I would want. So I'm going to treat <laughs> my team the way that I would want to be treated. So, I mean, you would think that would be more common sense sometimes, but sometimes human nature takes over and, and biases and things take over and, you know, here we are. But yeah, I, absolutely. I love that you said the, it's almost like you need to be the leader that you want, right? What would you want your leader to do? I want my leader to care about like, and align my work with the things I'm great at and the things that inspire me. Well, how, how are you doing that for your team? I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm really excited that you had all this stuff. I hope that somebody out there who's a technical numbers person, you know, understands a little bit more of what it takes to, you know, become a leader. And like what Kirk just said, it just means you. So just a better version of you, just always growing and always being creative and innovative and all that. Um, so I just have a couple more for you. But before I go on to the last question, Kirk, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you kind of just you want to make sure those people out there really knows or some last little bit of wisdom that you want to kind of bestow? So, uh, I don't know if this is great leadership wisdom, but uh, maybe I'll tell you a story about um, an insight that I've had this year that is affecting how I spend my day and time. So I, um, I told you before, I'm not a very organized person and I've learned a little bit about like routines people have, but I think the big insight that I had is if you want to have that biggest impact and for me to reach my own potential, I gotta make sure I'm spending my time on the things that are most critical, right? And time management, and everyone's busy yes. and you always got things. So what do you do about that? And it's like, well, just, yeah, you're just going to work harder. I'm not going to work 24 hours a day. I told you, like, there's a place for work. It's important. I dedicate to it. But there's a lot of other things that are important in life. So I got all that going on. So what do you do about all that? Mm -hmm. And um, I've been indoctrinated now into the, the world of habits and routines. And the insight I had personally is I used to be the person that was like, 
I've got free will and I'm not organized and I fly by the seat of my pants because that's what makes life worth living. And um, anyone who like schedules their day down to the five minutes, they must be an automaton and not really be. <laughs> right, and You're not a robot. More, yeah, you don't want to be a robot. And so I always like eschew time management and habit building and, and routines, stuff like that. And boy, <laughs> I have experimented with different types of routines and stuff like that. And uh, my new quote is, discipline is freedom. And I've actually found having a schedule to like, you know, I don't take meetings on Monday morning because this is when I do that reflective work, right? Mm -hmm. I get up, I'm not a more, for years, I've been a night owl. Okay. Um, I am now a morning person and I get up at six o'clock every day, including the weekends. Wow. And I know what every day I'm going to do between six and seven because I planned it out. It was my past self telling my future self what they wanted to do when they probably wanted to stay in bed. And when I just do what's on my schedule, I feel so liberated because I don't have to decide. Nope. And I always make sure it's like paying myself first. I'm making sure the things that are most critical to me are getting done. Mm -hmm. And so that just whole thing around, oh, if you're a routiner uh, and a schedule follower, you must be a mindless automaton and not a real person. I was wrong. I changed my mind. I made a mistake. <laughs> Those powerful leadership phrases. That's right. I am uh, I'm now a true believer in the power of routines. Um, when well constructed to the clarity of what you want to be doing. And so um, I would invite people to think about that. If you want to do show notes on some uh, books or something that inspired yeah. that, I can share those as well. But Oh, that's awesome. No, that, I mean, that's great. It, it's funny that you bring that up because just recently I was on a coaching call with some clients and we talked about exactly what you just said about routine and a lot of people like you said i don't want to be stuck on a routine i don't want to yes. have to plan every month oh i want to be free and a free spirit and, and you are talking to a free spirit let me just tell you right now <laughs> but but at the same time i i had told them i said but do you realize that when you set a routine and you set the things that you want to do it's less stress there's like heart, there's very little stress. And if something comes up, then you can tweak it. And, you know, but if you just don't have a plan, I mean, that's where the stress and the anxiety and the lack of freedom, like you said, pops in. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. That's, that's a huge point for this. So thanks for Coaching that. advice straight from Christy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. But I mean, look at, look at what happened with you though. I mean, like you said, you were kind of like routine schmoutine, whatever, who cares? But then you kind of found out, you found the routine that worked for you, obviously, yes. right? Because not everybody wants post-its or, you know, an app or a calendar or whatever, right? So you, the big thing here is that you found the routine that works for you and you know, bless you that you're still waking up at six in the morning every single day that obviously that routine worked for you. So that's awesome. Okay. So I'm going to close it out, but I would love for you to tell everybody a really interesting fact about Kirk. It could be a story. It could be something personal. What is like a really super cool fact that people can relate to even more on? I don't know. I feel like I've told a lot of things. People usually are surprised that I, I, I've played in rock bands and Irish Celt bands and metal bands and stuff like that. I used to have long hair, not so much anymore. Um, but maybe I tell a story that's maybe an extension of my whole routine thing. Yeah. I lifted 135 pounds over my head and I've never done that before. And I never thought I'd be able to do that. Right. Wow. So that's like, Oh, good, good. You're a gym rat or whatever. Um, <laughs> But what's important about, so that's interesting and like, but what's actually important about that story is, you know, part of that routine thing is almost like if you're your own coach, then you say, oh, well, I, I'm going to get up at six o'clock anymore. And they don't question what the coach does. Just when six o'clock comes around, you said you were going to do this and you should do it. Yeah. Um, and I've found, um, and I used to, I've always been doing something active. And for a long time, I was doing distance running, which I still enjoy. Good. Um, but it's one thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, I got connected with this coach who's into this functional fitness sort of movement where it's not, oh, well, can you run and specialize? It's like, well, can you run for two hours? 
And can you also sprint for 10 seconds? And can you lift a barbell over your head? And can you move a table? And can you wow. swim? And could you climb a rope? And could you get over the fence if it, the zombie apocalypse happened and you were <laughs> are getting away from the zombie horde? Yeah. Um, so it's not interesting that I can lift that and a lot of people can lift, but what the, maybe the interesting part is um, the insight I had from going from, oh, I'm, I can do endurance and run around I realized I like I'm a weakling and I didn't even know it right because I thought I'm fit and active but it goes to I think the insight I've been having is the power of variety and so like in that context the activity is every day with this coach is today we're going to take sandbags and we're going to throw them over a fence and tomorrow we're going to climb a rope and next week we're going to go on a bike ride and it's like wow. oh that constantly varied stimulus is creating a different set of potential in me, going, yes, my, my, my potential. So, hey, can I do that? Did I ever think I would do it before? But I took the opportunity to seek out a variety of things. And then all I did during all this time is I just did what my coach told me, right? Whatever the routine was, and that's working. And I think I've noticed that in other parts of my life, like, should we all be at 72 degrees all day, even if it's hot outside or cold outside? <laughs> getting some variety in the environment. It's important for us to get a variety of relationships and interactions, yeah. you know? And so just this concept of variety wow. from this simple idea of doing things differently in my physical activity has extended across to, I think variety is part of the, one of those ingredients to potential. And that has just lots of dimensions to try a lot of creative outlets. Uh, like I said, a lot of those people to learn new subjects and that variety of subjects actually makes you better at your own subject. And then, you know, one day maybe I'll be able to lift a car. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> so I don't know if that's an interesting fact about me, but uh, it's something I did uh, this, this week. Um, and I think it is connected to maybe a, a broader insight. So that's why I thought it. No, that, that's great. And, and when you lift a car, you let me know, we're going to get you back on here on that's Christmas that right. TV. Well. <laughs> We'll do the uh, Kirk Roy Strongman show. That's right. Like you saw it here first. Like, look at these things. <laughs> yeah, I have the guns, you know, ready. Um, yeah, no, that would that's awesome. But I, I love that. I just asked you an interesting fact about you. But then you, you like, created another teaching moment. Like, that was super <laughs> cool, right? <laughs> and by the way, this is, you know, when you do variety, this is how you grow and, you know, how it related to your life. So, like, that was like a twofer right there, I think. You well, know? There you go. Well, may, maybe, maybe that when you talk about my, myself and that, uh, I do get excited about ideas, especially ideas that have insight for that potential. All roads lead back to there. So, sure. Um, uh, that's what gets interesting about me. Good. No, I, and in, you know, in the very, very beginning of this interview, you know, I, you said, oh, there's not really a lot of interesting things. Well, I think we just have uh, several, several minutes of interesting things about Kirk Roy. So Kirk, I am so excited that you, you took the time out of your busy schedule to be here. I hope everybody who's been watching really got a lot out of this. I don't know. What else can you say? I mean, you've got a guy here that isn't afraid to be himself. He has literally flown up that leadership ladder and he's completely authentic. This is, I mean, as long as I've known Kirk, everything that you just saw on video, this is how he really is in person. You know, he's a casual dude and you know, he's always there to uh, lend a helping hand and to be helpful. So hopefully we'll see you next time, Kirk. It was awesome to have you here. Hopefully we'll have you back on the show. Yeah, well, thank you. It was a pleasure. I really had a good time. I learned things during the conversation, and I really hope everyone else out there um, found it useful and helpful. So thank yes. you. Absolutely. All right, everybody, we will see you next time. How fun was that? Isn't Kirk the most non-traditional VP that you've met? And it just goes to show you can be super successful, build a stellar team, call people dude, and still be true to yourself as a valued leader. So what was your aha moment? And most importantly, what is the tip that you're going to put in action to become a more relatable or more authentic leader? How are you going to stay more true to yourself? Let me know in the comments below. And if you love these leadership tips today, give this video a thumbs up. If you loved what you saw today and you want more, you got it. Just hit the subscribe button 
and the bell icon below and you'll never miss an episode. And if you know someone who could use these leadership tips, success strategies, and motivational stories, well hit the share button below and share it with them. They may just thank you for it. Thanks for tuning in to Christy TV and keep breaking that leadership mold. Do you wanna be a confident next level leader, but your job doesn't offer any solid training? Are you unsure of how or where to start? Then let's talk. Schedule a free leadership strategy session with me. If you're a driven professional and you're serious about taking your success to the next level, just click the link in the description below. We'll talk about your challenges and next steps you can take to be the leader you're meant to be. Let's move you forward now.